dream within a dream. Take this kiss upon the brow, and in parting from you now, thus much let me avow, you are not wrong who deem that my days have been a dream, yet if hope has flown away in a night or in a day, in a vision or in none, is it therefore the less gone? All that we see or seem is but a dream within a dream. I stand amid the roar of a surf tormented shore, and I hold within my hand grains of the golden sand. How few, yet how they creep through my fingers to the deep, while I weep, while I weep. O oh God, can I not grasp them with a tighter clasp? O oh God, can I not save one from the pitiless wave? Is all that we see or seem but a dream within a dream? Annabel Lee It was many and many a year ago, in a kingdom by the sea, that a maiden there lived whom you may know by the name of Annabel Lee. And this maiden she lived with no other thought than to love and be loved by me. She was a child, and I was a child, in this kingdom by the sea, but we loved with a love that was more than love, I and my Annabel Lee, with a love that the winged seraphs of heaven coveted her and me. And this was the reason that, long ago, in this kingdom by the sea, a wind blew out of a cloud by night, chilling my Annabel Lee, so that her high-born kinsman came and bore her away from me to shut her up in a sepulchre in this kingdom by the sea. The angels, not half so happy in heaven, went envying her and me. Yes, that was the reason, as all men know, in this kingdom by the sea, that the wind came out of a cloud chilling and killing my Annabel Lee. But our love, it was stronger by far than the love of those who were older than we, of many far wiser than we. And neither the angels in heaven above, nor the demons down under the sea, can ever dissever my soul from the soul of the beautiful Annabel Lee. For the moon never beams without bringing me dreams of the beautiful Annabel Lee. And the stars never rise, but I see the bright eyes of the beautiful Annabel Lee. And so, all the night tide, I lie down by the side of my darling, my darling, my life and my bride, in her sepulchre, there by the sea, in her tomb by the side of the sea. The Bells Hear the sledges with the bells, silver bells, what a world of merriment their melody foretells, how they tinkle, 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 in the icy air of night, while the stars that oversprinkle all the heavens seem to twinkle with a crystalline delight, keeping time, 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 in a sort of runic rhyme, to the tintinabulation that so musically swells, from the bells, 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 from the jingling and the tinkling of the bells. Hear the mellow wedding bells, golden bells, what a world of happiness their harmony foretells. Through the balmy air of night, 
how they ring out their delight from the molten golden notes and all in tune what a liquid ditty floats to the turtle dove that listens while she gloats on the moon. Oh, from out the sounding cells, what a gush of euphony voluminously wells. How it swells, how it dwells, on the future, how it tells, of the rapture that impels, to the swinging and the ringing, of the bells, 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 of the bells, 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 to the rhyming and the chiming of the bells. Hear the loud alarm bells, brazen bells, what a tale of terror now their turbulency tells. In the startled ear of night, how they scream out their affright. Too much horrified to speak, they can only shriek, shriek, out of tune, in a clamorous appealing to the mercy of the fire, in a mad expostulation with the deaf and frantic fire. Leaping higher, 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 with a desperate desire and a resolute endeavour, now, now to sit or never, by the side of the pale-faced moon. Oh, the bells, 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 what a tale their terror tells of despair, how they clang and clash and roar, what a horror they outpour on the bosom of the palpitating air. Yet the ear it fully knows, by the twanging and the clanging, how the danger ebbs and flows. Yet the ear distinctly tells, in the jangling and the wrangling, how the danger sinks and swells, by the sinking or the swelling, in the anger of the bells, of the bells, of the bells, 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 bells in the clamour and the clangour of the bells. Hear the tolling of the bells, iron bells, what a world of solemn thought their monody compels, in the silence of the night, how we shiver with a fright at the melancholy meaning of their tone, for every sound that floats from the rust within their throats is a groan, and the people, ah, the people, they that dwell up in the steeple, all alone, and who, tolling, 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 in that muffled monotone, feel a glory in so rolling, on the human heart, a stone. They are neither man nor woman, they are neither brute nor human, they are ghouls, and their king it is who tolls, and he rolls, 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 a paean from the bells, and his merry bosom swells with the paean of the bells, and he dances, and he yells, keeping time, 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 in a sort of runic rhyme, to the paean of the bells, of the bells keeping time, 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 in a sort of runic rhyme, to the throbbing of the bells, of the bells, 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 to the sobbing of the bells, keeping time, 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 as he knells, 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 in a happy runic rhyme, to the rolling of the bells, of the bells, 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 to the tolling of the bells, of the bells, 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 to the moaning and the groaning of the bells. For Annie Thank heaven, the crisis, the danger is past and the lingering illness is over at last, and the fever called living is conquered at last. Sadly, I know I am shorn of my strength, and no muscle I move 
as I lie at full length. But no matter, I feel I am better at length. And I rest so composedly now in my bed that any beholder might fancy me dead, might start at beholding me, thinking me dead. The moaning and groaning, the sighing and sobbing, are quieted now with that horrible throbbing. At heart, ah, that horrible, horrible throbbing. The sickness, the nausea, the pitiless pain, have ceased with the fever that maddened my brain with the fever called living that burned in my brain. And oh, of all tortures, that torture the worst, has abated the terrible torture of thirst. For the naphthalene river of passion accursed, I have drank of a water that quenches all thirst, of a water that flows with a lullaby sound, from a spring but a very few, feet underground, from a cavern not very far, down underground. And ah, let it never be foolishly said, that my room it is gloomy and narrow my bed, for man never slept in a different bed, and to sleep you must slumber in just such a bed. My tantalised spirit here blandly reposes Forgetting, or never regretting its roses, its old agitations of myrtles and roses. For now, while so quietly lying it fancies, a holier odour about it of pansies, a rosemary odour commingled with pansies, with rue and the beautiful Puritan pansies. And so it lies happily bathing in many, a dream of the truth and the beauty of Annie, drowned in a bath of the tresses of Annie. She tenderly kissed me, she fondly caressed, and then I fell gently to sleep on her breast, deeply to sleep from the heaven of her breast. When the light was extinguished, she covered me warm, and she prayed to the angels to keep me from harm, to the queen of the angels to shield me from harm. And I lie so composedly now in my bed, knowing her love, that you fancy me dead. And I rest so contentedly now in my bed, with her love at my breast, that you fancy me dead, that you shudder to look at me, thinking me dead. But my heart, it is brighter than all of the many stars in the sky, for it sparkles with Annie, it glows with the light of the love of my Annie, with the thought of the light of the eyes of my Annie. The Haunted Palace in the greenest of our valleys, by good angels tenanted, once a fair and stately palace, radiant palace, reared its head. In the monarch thought's dominion, it stood there, never seraph spread a pinion over fabric half so fair. Banners yellow, glorious, Golden, on its roof, did float and flow. This, all this, was in the olden time, long ago. And every gentle air that dallied in that sweet day, along the ramparts, plumed and pallid, a winged odour went away. Wanderers, in that happy valley, through two luminous windows saw spirits moving musically to a lute's well-tuned law. Round about a throne where, sitting, Porphyrogene, in state 
his glory well befitting, the ruler of the realm was seen. And all with pearl and ruby glowing was the fair palace door through which came flowing, 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 and sparkling evermore a troop of echoes whose sweet duty was but to sing in voices of surpassing beauty the wit and wisdom of their king. But evil things in robes of sorrow assailed the monarch's high estate. Ah, let us mourn, for never morrow shall dawn upon him desolate. And round about his home the glory that blushed and bloomed is but a dim remembered story of the old time entombed. And travellers now within that valley through the red litten windows see vast forms that move fantastically to a discordant melody, while, like a ghastly rapid river, through the pale door, a hideous throng rush out forever and laugh but smile no more. The Raven Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered, weak and weary, over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, while I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. "'Tis some visitor,' I muttered, tapping at my chamber door, only this, and nothing more. Ah, distinctly, I remember, it was in the bleak December, and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly I wished the morrow, vainly I had sought to borrow from my books surcease of sorrow, sorrow for the lost Lenore, for the rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore, nameless here, Forevermore, and the silken, sad, uncertain rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me, filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before, so that now, to still the beating of my heart, I stood repeating, "'Tis some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door, some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door." This it is, and nothing more. Presently my soul grew stronger, hesitating then no longer. Sir, said I, or madam, truly your forgiveness I implore. But the fact is I was napping, and so gently you came rapping, and so faintly you came tapping, tapping at my chamber door, that I scarce was sure I heard you. Here I opened wide the door, Darkness there, and nothing more. Deep into that darkness peering, Long I stood there, wondering, fearing, Doubting, dreaming dreams, No mortal ever dared to dream before. But the silence was unbroken, And the stillness gave no token, And the only word there spoken Was the whispered word, Lenore. This I whispered, and an echo murmured back the word, Lenore, merely this, and nothing more. Back into the chamber turning, all my soul within me burning, soon again I heard a tapping, somewhat louder than before. Surely, said I, surely that is something at my window lattice. Let me see, then, what thereat is, and this mystery explore. Let my heart be still a moment, 
and this mystery explore. Tis the wind and nothing more. Open here I flung the shutter, when, with many a flirt and flutter, in there stepped a stately raven of the saintly days of yore. Not the least obeisance made he, not a minute stopped or stayed he, but with mien of lord or lady, perched above my chamber door, perched upon a bust of Pallas, just above my chamber door, perched and sat, and nothing more. Then this ebony bird beguiling my sad fancy into smiling by the grave and stern decorum of the countenance it wore. Though thy crest be shorn and shaven, thou, I said, art sure no craven, ghastly grim and ancient raven, wandering from the nightly shore. Tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's Plutonian shore. Quoth the raven, Nevermore. Much I marvelled this ungainly fowl to hear discourse so plainly, though its answer little meaning, little relevancy bore, for we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door, bird or beast upon the sculptured bust above his chamber door, with such name as nevermore. But the raven, sitting lonely on the placid bust, spoke only that one word, as if his soul in that one word he did outpour. Nothing farther then he uttered, not a feather then he fluttered, till I scarcely more than muttered, other friends have flown before, on the morrow he will leave me, as my hopes have flown before. Then the bird said, Nevermore. Startled at the stillness broken by reply so aptly spoken, Doubtless, said I, what it utters is its only stock and store, Caught from some unhappy master, whom unmerciful disaster Followed fast and followed faster, till his songs one burden bore, Till the dirges of his hope, that melancholy burden bore, Of never, never more. But the raven, still beguiling all my fancy into smiling, straight I wheeled a cushioned seat in front of bird and bust and door. Then, upon the velvet sinking, I betook myself to linking, fancy unto fancy, thinking what this ominous bird of yore, what this grim, ungainly, ghastly, gaunt, and ominous bird of yore meant in croaking, Nevermore. This I sat engaged in guessing, but no syllable expressing to the fowl whose fiery eyes now burned into my bosom's core. This and more I sat divining, with my head at ease reclining on the cushion's velvet lining that the lamplight gloated o'er, but whose velvet violet lining with the lamplight gloating o'er she shall press, ah, never more. Then, methought, the air grew denser, perfumed from an unseen censer, swung by seraphim, whose footfalls tinkled on the tufted floor. Wretch, I cried, thy God hath lent thee, by these angels he hath sent thee, respite, respite and nepenthe from thy memories of Lenore. Quaff, O oh, quaff this kind Nepenthe, and forget this lost Lenore, quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, whether tempter sent, or whether tempest tossed thee here ashore, desolate, yet all undaunted, on this desert land enchanted, on this home by horror haunted, Tell me truly, I implore, is there, is there balm in Gilead? Tell me, tell me, I implore, quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, by that heaven that bends above us, 
by that God we both adore, tell this soul with sorrow laden, if, within the distant Aden, it shall clasp a sainted maiden, whom the angels name Lenore, clasp a rare and radiant maiden, whom the angels name Lenore, quoth the raven, nevermore. Be that word our sign of parting, bird or fiend, I shrieked, upstarting, Get thee back into the tempest and the night Plutonian shore. Leave no black plume as a token of that lie thy soul hath spoken. Leave my loneliness unbroken. Quit the bust above my door. Take thy beak from out my heart and take thy form from off my door. Quoth the raven, nevermore. And the raven, never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting on the pallid bust of Pallas, just above my chamber door, and his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming, and the lamplight, o'er him streaming, throws his shadow on the floor, and my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted nevermore. Oolaloom. The skies, they were ashen and sober. The leaves, they were crisped and sear. The leaves, they were withering and sear. It was night in the lonesome October of my most immemorial year. It was hard by the dim lake of Orba in the misty mid-region of Weir. It was down by the dank tarn of Orba, in the ghoul-haunted woodland of Weir. Here once, through an alley titanic, of Cyprus I roamed with my soul, of Cyprus with Psyche my soul. These were the days when my heart was volcanic, as the scoriac rivers that roll, as the lavas that restlessly roll, the sulphurous currents down Yannick, in the ultimate climes of the pole, that groan as they roll down Mount Yannick, in the realms of the boreal pole. Our talk, had been serious and sober, but our thoughts, they were palsied and sear, our memories were treacherous and sear, for we knew not the month was October, and we marked not the night of the year. Ah, night of all nights in the year, we noted not the dim lake of Orba, though once we had journeyed down here. We remembered not the dank tarn of Orba, nor the ghoul-haunted woodland of Weir. And now, as the night was senescent, and star-dials pointed to morn, as the star-dials hinted of morn, at the end of our path, a liquescent and nebulous luster was born, out of which a miraculous crescent arose with a duplicate horn. Astartes bediamonded crescent, distinct with its duplicate horn. And I said, she is warmer than Dian, she rolls through an ether of sighs. She revels in a region of sighs. She has seen that the tears are not dry on these cheeks where the worm never dies and has come past the stars of the lion to point us the path to the skies, to the lethean peace of the skies. Come up in despite of the lion To shine on us with her bright eyes Come up 
through the lair of the lion, with love in her luminous eyes. But Psyche, uplifting her finger, said, Sadly, this star I mistrust. Her pallor I strangely mistrust. O oh, hasten, O, oh, let us not linger. O oh, fly, let us fly, for we must. In the terror she spoke, letting sink her wings till they trailed in the dust. In agony sobbed, letting sink her plumes till they trailed in the dust, till they sorrowfully trailed in the dust. I replied, this is nothing but dreaming. Let us on by this tremulous light. Let us bathe in this crystalline light. Its sibyllic splendor is beaming with hope and in beauty tonight. See, it flickers up the sky through the night. Ah, we safely may trust to its gleaming and be sure it will lead us aright. We safely may trust to a gleaming that cannot but guide us aright since it flickers up to heaven through the night. Thus I pacified Psyche and kissed her and tempted her out of her gloom and conquered her scruples and gloom and we passed to the end of the vista but were stopped by the door of a tomb by the door of a legended tomb and I said What is written, sweet sister, on the door of this legended tomb? She replied, Ulalum, Ulalum, tis the vault of thy lost Ulalum. Then my heart, it grew ashen and sober, as the leaves that were crisped and sere, as the leaves that were withering and sere. And I cried, it was surely October, on this very night of last year, that I journeyed, I journeyed down here, that I brought a dread burden down here. On this night, of all nights in the year, oh, what demon has tempted me here? Well, I know now this dim lake of Orba, this misty mid-region of Weir. Well, I know now this dank tarn of Orba in the ghoul-haunted woodland of Weir. Said we then, the two then, ah, can it have been that the woodlandish ghouls, the pitiful, the merciful ghouls, to bar up our way and to ban it from the secret that lies in these walls, from the thing that lies hidden in these walls, had drawn up the spectre of a planet from the limbo of lunary souls, this sinfully scintillant planet from the hell of the planetary souls.